Let us come to God in prayer. O Lord, open our eyes and open our ears and open our hearts and our minds so we might see, hear, know, and understand the word that you have for us today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our scripture comes from John chapter 12, verses 12 through 16. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, and as it is written, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So last summer, I was in the midst of uh, interviewing with churches. I was doing Zoom calls almost every day. I was online trying to look at churches. And while I was doing that, or when I wasn't doing that, uh, I had a part-time gig at the local Michael's Arts and Crafts store, uh, where I was the framing department manager. And at one point, I was ordering supplies for our projects, and I noticed that somehow we had blown through 150 square feet of pink mat board, the, that paper that goes around the edge of the picture between the picture and the frame. It, it was normal to go through that much black mat board. I mean, if you've had something framed or if you have anything framed, often it's black or white, but pink. I didn't really catch what was going on. I found out later from one of my colleagues that uh, Taylor Swift was in town. <laughs> and Swifties had come from all over the city and frankly all over the state, bringing tickets and posters and wristbands and uh, signage they had stolen from the uh, event space and anything they could find and were framing it in pink. Eventually, I had a couple interactions with these customers. I was curious and nosy, as one is when you're in this line of work. I often just like to talk to people, and I, was, I had a lot of fun asking them random questions. And I would ask them what their favorite part was. Admittedly, some of these, it was mostly young girls, mostly girls between, I don't know, 12 and 18 that were spending $300 on frames, but that's another conversation. <laughs> What their, I asked them what their favorite part of it was, what their favorite, favorite part of the concert was. And without fail, it was one of two things. You know, the first was the friendship bracelets. It's a thing. Uh, and I knew this because I worked at Michael's. So they had friendship bracelets, and they had all these little beads on them, and they meant something, or would spell out you know, their name or where they were from. And they'd make dozens of them and then at the concert would exchange them with absolute strangers. But there was a sense of community that was built between all those young women. Uh, there were more people than that, but mostly teenage girls that were running amok at a concert. I, sorry, it terrifies me. The thought terrifies me, clearly. <laughs> the second and, and the, the most frequently mentioned thing was singing songs by heart with thousands of other people in the stadium. That struck me. We do that, don't we? Maybe not thousands, and maybe not always by heart, but we do that. 
for as long as people, and, and Webb, you can correct me at some point if you need to, but for as long as people have been gathering in communities, singing together has been important. Singing together does something. You say the same words as one. You end up breathing as one. The words that you say or chant or sing unify you. And even if you haven't been part of a choir, you've hopefully sung at least a little bit in church with us. You've then told stories through those hymns. You've prayed prayers. We've praised God together, expressing something very personal and intimate together, our faith. As one, we sing and say these words. In this morning's passage, we read about one of those moments, those moments when music and chanting, when sound taking control of the situation unifies people. Our text begins five days before the Passover. Jesus and his disciples had just left the home of Mary and Martha and the no longer dead Lazarus, which is notable, kind of a big deal. They were heading into Jerusalem. They were heading there for Passover. News had traveled, stories about how Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead had traveled, but also news traveled that Jesus was about to enter Jerusalem. So remember, this is Jerusalem, but this is not Jerusalem that belonged to the Hebrew people. This was Jerusalem under Roman rule. The people paid taxes to Caesar. The people followed Caesar's rules. The people were expected to have absolute, absolute allegiance to Caesar. In private circles, they might say that they worshiped the God of Israel, but if a Roman official was present or asked them, they would immediately be expected to say, oh yes, we worship Caesar. So unless you were having some sort of benign party of any kind, a birthday party or something like that, there would really be no reason to be chanting or singing or saying anything other than to lift up Caesar, because otherwise you'd be in trouble. You could get in big trouble. The only hero, the only victor, the only one worthy of celebrating, and frankly, the only one to be happy was Caesar in this city and in this setting. But when Jesus arrived in Jerusalem that day, there wasn't a word about Caesar, was there? The people cut down branches off the trees and laid them in the streets. They cut down more and were waving them in the air, chanting together and singing Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus rode into town so that his feet wouldn't touch the ground on a donkey. That donkey's feet didn't even touch the ground because branches were laid out. People's jackets, their, their outer robes would have been laid down. This was the welcome that Caesar would have wanted. This is the welcome for a king. This was for not Caesar. This was for Jesus. This was too exuberant for those who were under the Roman rule and therefore it was 100% entirely treasonous to do. Singing like this, chanting like this would have been submersive, subversive and bold. It would have been courageous, outrageous, reckless, certainly dangerous. It would have been contagious though too. These people who have longed for wholeness and hope finally saw it entering into the city. 
They needed that hope. And so they would have certainly seen it and joined in. Such a dangerous act and yet such sweeping excitement. But what we don't see, what we don't know, is where the disciples were. This passage, uh, this, this iteration of the story, it's told in all of the Gospels. But in John's version, we don't know where the disciples are. What were they doing? Where were they? Were they within the vicinity? Were they leading the crowds? We've been following Peter throughout Lent. And we've seen Peter in some interesting places. We saw Peter as a fisherman, annoyed about Jesus, and then pursued by Jesus. He received a bounty of fish from Jesus and, and then a call to follow Jesus. He had the faith to walk on water to Jesus. But then as he stumbled, reached out and was rescued by Jesus. He confidently professed his faith in Jesus and then was told to get out of Jesus' way. He asked questions. He learned to ask questions. He received and learned a lot of grace and forgiveness. But now, lately, in the days leading up to this event, Jesus was making no secret of the fact that this wasn't going to be a fun trip to Jerusalem. Jesus knew what was going to happen, and he was telling his disciples, this isn't going to end well. So where would Peter have been? Was he in the front row, wild-eyed and raising his branches and all the branches he could find? which would be true to Peter's form, all in? Or was he swept up in the excitement? He certainly knew how much this hope meant for all the people. Or was he thinking, pondering, standing in the back row at a distance? Was he near the Pharisees that would be chattering in the back trying to figure out how they were going to get rid of Jesus. If you look at the front of your bulletin, you'll see the, the featured artwork for this week. And it's an image of Peter. It's that moment, the, the, the big image of him is that moment at the palms, or when the palms are being raised, when Jesus is entering the city. And if you, in our, in our class that we had before worship, we talked about how this face almost looks expressionless. And yet as you look at it, uh, the wheels are turning. Something's going on in that mind. What was Peter thinking? <laughs> Verse 16 of our passage says, the disciples did not know. They didn't know what was going on at first. After Jesus was glorified, however, after he was raised from the dead, then they remembered. Then they remembered. Peter was witnessing something strange, a political protest that welcomed and celebrated Jesus as the uncrowned king of God's people all the while knowing that Jesus was preparing for his death. He was trying to probably participate in one way or another, and yet struggling to, to separate himself from that intoxicating joy and the music and the sound. John pauses in his gospel for this moment. Peter didn't understand. None of the disciples understood until they did. 
And I wonder what that moment was. I wonder what triggered those memories. Memory and music are so closely entwined, and, and research has shown that as you hear sounds and listen to music, the same parts of your brain will start firing off as when you're asked to remember something. I've seen this in many a person that I visited in, in communities and uh, churches that I've served elsewhere too. Someone can be in the latest stages of dementia and if I, I show up and this little caller, I say this all the time, it gives me a lot of permission. Uh, it grants me a lot of leeway, but when I, if I bring communion, for example, and I start praying the Lord's Prayer, <clears throat> people who haven't made connection with other people in weeks, days, weeks, will suddenly light up and start reciting that prayer with me. It's beautiful to see, and, and, and it emphasizes this idea that what we hear and what we sing and what we, what sounds we have together are important. So I, I wonder for Peter if these sounds, these chants, these cries, of joy of God's people, no less. These, bear, these sounds that would one very soon bear great despair. I wonder how those sounds would have been for him. They marked a point of change for him. They marked a very negative point in his time with Jesus. This crowd that was gathered and singing in joy, would very soon not be singing the same. Shouts would change from Hosanna, praise the king, into who is this man? Crucify him. What is being remembered? We entered today's service with the hype of Palm Sunday. We are now preparing to see a turning, if we turn, we see a darkening sky. We hear thunder in the distance the low rumble of an angry crowd on the move. Listen. May the words that we share in this space of worship today resonate with love and yet prepare us for the dark moments of life and for guiding us through this passion story this week. Amen.